Schools Board of Education. It is Monday, October 9th at 7.02 p.m. and we are at NCI Eastlake. <clears throat> Mr. Parkinson, will you call the roll? Dr. Beal? Here. Mr. Jones? Here. Mrs. Pashinsky? Here. Mrs. Warner? Here. Mrs. Zern? Here. Will you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Parkinson, is there anyone who would like to speak? No, Mrs. Warner. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, introducing our guest. Thank you, uh, Madam President. It's a uh, great pleasure to introduce Allison Aber, who is the principal at Longfellow Elementary, and she will be presenting with Lisa George. Do I have this in the right order? I didn't look it down. I'm sorry. Yes, you did good. I did good. Okay. <laughs> Pure luck. And Lisa George, who is the principal at um, Thomas Jefferson Elementary School. And so you're going to start to get the sense of the pattern of information for our building principals reporting back to the school board and community at large uh, regarding uh, the, our strategic plan and how we're implementing it. So without further ado, ladies. how our students are performing. 
and it will help us make decisions at a classroom level, but also at a district level. For example, if we noticed at Longfellow and at TJ and at Grant that our students didn't hit the indicator, they didn't do well on measurement, then we need to think and look at what we're teaching and how we're teaching measurement across the district uh, to decide is there a better way to be teaching this. These assessments will all be online, and they, they also look a lot like the air tests that students take at the end of each year. So not only are we getting information for instruction from the students for taking these tests, but we're also getting them ready to take the assessments at the end of the year. Uh, so teacher teams will analyze and see how did our students do, and then as principals, we'll look a little bit more globally at how our schools do as compared with each other. Which takes us into instructional strategies. So instructional strategies are basically just the way that we teach whatever it is we just learned about. So after we know that these certain standards are being taught and we look at our benchmark assessments and we see what our needs are, we can then look at what type of ways are we teaching the students. And we want to always make sure that most of these are research-based, which is why we're really focusing on Marzano this year. And he's got things like comparing and contrasting, <coughs> similarities and differences, um, cooperative learning, focusing on those 21st century learning skills, as well as other different strategies that help students kind of process through that information and being able to showcase it. Uh, we have done our professional development at the beginning of the year was based on these strategies, and then our professional development sessions throughout the rest of the year are also centered around those, and we're also having those conversations in our TVTs and at grade level meetings. Um, to really kind of find out what do our teachers need and how can we best give them that professional development. What's a TBT? Oh, a teacher-based team. So during the, one of their common planning times, we get them all together as a team to figure out what they need and how we can help support them in their implementation of all of these pieces and parts. So we've talked about the instruction, the assessment, and the strategies that we're using to teach it. But one of the most important jobs of a principal is on a daily basis, being visible in the classroom, seeing what instruction looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. And we make it our goal and priority to be in as many classrooms as we can on a day-to-day -day basis. One thing we're doing differently this year to hold ourselves accountable as well as our teachers is we are looking for specific things and we're taking specific data down on our walkthrough. So I just wanted to give you a quick taste of some of the things that we're looking for when we go into a class. Uh, I walk into a class, I'm going to look right away and see what's the rigor of instruction. Rigor meaning how hard is it, how challenged are our students. What level do they have to think at? Do they have to just memorize something? Or do they have to synthesize and really think critically about what it is that they're learning? And we're taking note, and we also know that not everything is a high level thinking skill. So we want to speak, we kind of want to get an idea of where we're at with our, the level of thinking and the rigor that we're asking uh, our students to go through each day. And with rigor comes student engagement. Are the students participating? Are they actively sharing? Are they um, a participant in the learning or are they sitting back with passive within the classroom? We're looking to see are the instructional strategies that we're teaching our teachers to use, are they being implemented? If so, which ones? Which ones are we seeing more than others? Which ones do we need to brush up on? And are the, is the lesson in line with the pacing guide that we have put together for the teachers? Are we teaching the right thing at the right time? Again, this holds us accountable, but it also holds our teachers accountable. And then and we can look at how our school is doing with our walkthroughs globally, but then as principals, we can share at our principals' meetings, this is what we're seeing, and this is what I think my teachers need, and maybe you're seeing something different, so what ideas do you have? And one of the things that we're going to continue this year, we um, elementary school wide, we all did a tutoring after school program um, last year. We wanted to um, narrow that down the focus of that a little bit. We kind of invited everyone to that tutoring program last year. This year, we want to target. We want to target our at risk risk students and invite them. And we're going to base that on on the data that we we get through our map and our dibbles and all our assessments that we give throughout the year, including our common assessments that we are going to start get, um, start giving real soon because we're coming to the end of quarter one. Um, one of the things that we um, thought of this year is the te teachers are going to model the, the test questions, model the types of responses and how to answer those questions and then have the kids, the students do that also. 
Um, some of the benefits of this is the groups are going to be smaller. We're trying to get our teachers that are very familiar with that content to tutor. And um, it'll help support the classroom instruction. But we also provide transportation home after the tutoring session and snack and uh, different incentives to attend so that they attend for us. Um, there's no cost to the parents at all. And um, we're going to send invitations. And we're probably thinking, we're not, we are thinking of doing that in January. OK? Um, our goal is to show improvement and achievement so that this program, we're going to track the students and see how much they uh, improved in their academic achievement after this program. So kind of to summarize it all up, we are looking, we kind of went through the backwards planning for you guys. We started out where we were looking at what does the state want from us with our standards, and now we're trying to tailor it into assessing our kids all the same so that way we can figure out how to best instruct them. Um, and then how we're going to keep that accountable through our walkthroughs and being present and then also through giving them that extra support for the elementary tutoring program for those kids that are just kind of always there on the bubble and need just that little extra support. And if you, if you, if you think about what you just heard today, our overarching goal, ladies, is what? Improve student achievement. Improve student achievement. We've, we've said all along we're going to target three ways to do that keeping students first. We didn't really hit on that here per se, but I think we all understand keeping students first means keeping the needs of students above the needs of the classroom teacher or the administrator or anyone else, any other employee in the district. Secondly, uh, we believe that uh, if we focus on instructional strategies, our teachers have more tools in their toolbox and they'll be better at what they do. So you see that laced throughout our goals and time on task we're trying to maximize the amount of time we do these things. So, and we're also picking up kind of a fourth element. If you teach and you're working hard, but you're not teaching the right things as it relates to the state standards, then you're, you're going to create gaps. And that's what the pacing guides are for. And you see those are out. Those are all out to your teachers and curriculums been working very hard to keep pushing those out in collaboration with teachers and administrators, fair to say, correct? And then sent to a central office for review. So that's all been happening. So those are the kind of reports we want to keep giving back to you so you're aware of what we're trying to do to make progress um, as a district. Excellent job. Are there any questions for these ladies? Thank you. Thank you guys very much. You don't have to stay here. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Gina Kevrin. Most of you know who she is. Um, she leads our curriculum department, which has been very busy this fall and uh, yes. summer. So without further ado, Gina. Great. Thank you very much for letting me take a few more minutes of your time tonight. We did introduce the concept of using Eliminate Education last year to be able to provide online assessments for our students, and they talked with you about common assessments tonight. So I want to give you a couple of examples of what students will see when they take a common assessment online and show you that it mirrors an error assessment. So since Mrs. Aver and Mrs. George are from an elementary building, um, any teacher that opens up their Illuminate account you see these colorful tiles on here. And if you see right here where my mouse is circling, where it says G3 ELA benchmark, that's called a tile. And we've created this assessment with teachers and principals. And if we push this tile out to just the third grade teachers will be able to see this. And when it's time for them to give their benchmark, they would click on this tile. And I'm going to show you a preview. And so if you're a third grader getting ready to take this test, this mirrors the error assessment. So on the error assessment, the students will have a passage to read. Over here on the left, you see it says a small town school. This is a passage a student reads. And on the right-hand side, there is a corresponding question. Let me show you a few examples. You'll see multiple choice options. And then you're going to see some different question types as well. Here is one that we call a drop-down. 
And again, this gives students practice taking the air assessment since it is online. Now you see it's jumped to a different passage that the students will read. They can scroll, read the passage, answer the question, and go on to the next question. Here, this also relates to that particular paragraph. This question type is a little bit different. This is what we call a constructive response. So the students read the passage. Here it says, explain how the illustration helps to describe the setting of the story, the old lion and the fox, which relates to one of their third grade standards. And they actually type their response in this box. We have another reading passage with corresponding questions. And another constructive response. So they get a lot of opportunity to take all the different types of questions that they would see on the state test. And Gina, and illuminate puts all this data together for us to use, correct? Yes, yeah, so once the students take that assessment, Illuminate grades the multiple choice questions, teachers do grade the constructive response, but all of that data is housed in Illuminate. So a teacher can pull up, and I can't do it right now because I have some student names attached to data, we'll do it at another time for you, I don't want to bring student names up because we do have some teachers already using this, but they can look at the results of the assessment by student and by standard. So as Mrs. Aber was talking about, they can look at if this test covers 10 different standards, they can pull up that standard and say, oh, 90% of the kids got these six standards right, but these two, they only had 40% of the students. And so they'll be able to use that data to know how to instruct their students for remediation. I'm gonna go back to my tiles. I'm going to show you one other quick example. I'm going to show you a high school example and see how much you remember about algebra. Okay. It's a little bit scary. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. It's a lot scary, actually. Do you have another thing? So here's an example of an algebra test. So here, the students are presented with some information, and they have to determine the value of y based on what they know about using this graph and they would actually type their answer in that box. Oh, sure. Multiple choice, is it all coming back to you now? <laughs> Hit the button. <laughs> I can't even see it. Was it bad? That would apply. That would apply, yeah. This is another interesting kind of questions that students will look at the graph and you see down here there's actually three rows they have to have multiple answers so one of the things that sometimes tricks students up on these online tests is they have to have multiple answers for a question and students need to take their time so we want them to practice reading directions carefully and knowing that this particular question I've got to answer several parts here not just one They have to calculate and then their answer. Multiple choice. This one, they have some information and they have to enter an equation. So they're applying this principles that they've learned in class. And these are very end of course exam like? Yes. Um, the, this one is one where they have to actually create a graph. <coughs> Is, is, are these um, tests um, a requirement of the district per se, or, 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 or is the motivation coming from the district, or is this in response to the state? This is really in response to the state, because the air assessments are, especially at the high school level, what we call in course exams, those are required for graduation. So every student at the high school level has to take an in course exam in English 1, English 2, Algebra, Geometry, American History, American Government, and Biology. So they have to earn points on those tests for graduation. So it's really incumbent upon us to be able to match our instruction and our assessment as closely to the state as we can. 
and also, as the um, principals talked about, checking their progress along the way. Not waiting until the end of the year to find out how they're doing on these online tests, but doing it throughout the course of the year. And what year did the AIRS test come on board? They have been, I think they changed from OAA Three. four years ago. Four. Is this our I third think? year or fourth iteration? Third or fourth year? Yeah. I can't remember exactly. They kind of run together. Is it our third? There was our, yeah, yeah. We went from park yeah. to air. Okay, so we were studying for the park at the time. Park. Yeah, we did our we, we did all of our transitions to park, yeah. park and, and then, then they pulled park out after one or two years, one, one, one year, one and year. then we came to air. How different were the assessments? Significantly different, and significantly different from how we assess in the district. So that's why we're trying to change how we're assessing in the district so it matches how these kids. And if you you might say, well. That seems like you're putting too much emphasis on the test. Well, my response to you is, if they don't pass the Algebra 1 end of course exam and the Algebra 2 and the geometry and all the others, the English and all the other ones that, that Gina mentioned, they will not graduate from high school. So who are we doing a service to by fighting the state at this point? We'll talk a little bit later about the efforts that we have to, for our pushback, but it's not through not preparing our students doing a disservice to our students if we do that. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of an idea of what the students will see. Now I've also had some questions about, well, is every test they take going to be online now? No. They're still going to do some paper tests. They'll still do some paper writing and some paper quizzes, but we are introducing more and more online tests so they're familiar with that platform. It's, it's really for the benefit of the students to be able to do that. Thank you, Gina. If we could, Madam President, I'd like to make one change in the agenda or just reorder it. Um, I'd like to have Ben go, because as much as I know Ben enjoys giving up his evening to come and talk about construction, which he's passionate about, I'm going to guess he doesn't want to hear Bill's, no offense, Bill, but Bill's <laughs> section. So if we could go ahead and Ben, if you could introduce yourself. And no ben. offense, Bill. <laughs> why, why does it always feel like Rodney Danger? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Ben Bonham. I'm with uh, AGS, and I'm one of the uh, construction managers I have to be overseeing North and Longfellow Elementary Schools, but I'm going to report on all the projects. And I actually would have rather followed Bill than followed them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's probably true. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Yeah. More Rodney. Because I could probably yeah. understand yeah. school finance better than I could go to college. Okay. Okay. On the screen. Most of those were tough. Uh, most, some of that brought some good memories. Um, um, yeah. It's tough. Uh, we're going to start with North, and I'm going to try to, to breeze through these as soon as it comes into focus as quickly as we can so that we know what's going on and you can move on to the rest of your meeting. So uh, in terms of where we're at at North High School, Structural Steel is well underway. At this point, uh, all the other trades were not, are not going to catch up to the Structural Steel that's going up. So what we call the critical path in the project, uh, the, one, the, uh, the, the sequence of operations that we pay the most attention to, now is starting to move away from steel and, some, and back into some of the other trades, like some of the concrete that remains, then some of the rough and like the mechanical and the electrical and the plumbing systems, and especially the roofing. So steel, as I said, is steadily moving forward. You guys are not going to catch them. They're going to stay ahead of everybody at this point. Roofing for the mechanical room is in. All the material for the humanities wing, which is the uh, area B, the one on the southern side, southern the two-story southern side of the building. Roofing is all there, it's stockpiled, we're waiting to get a little more roof decking on that gooseneck that connects feet to the rest of the building. The roofers are due back next week and they probably will stay on site until the rest of that building is rough. Remember that, the gym is done, completely out of the weather, the auditorium is out of the weather, the, weather. the stage is out of, out of the weather, the mechanical room is obviously, the next push will be B and then over into C where the kitchen is and then over into uh, uh, the locker rooms and the music area on the east side of the building and then over to uh, 
the uh, STEM, which is the two-story northern half academic area. All the undergrad utilities are completed except some minor electrical in the uh, Performing Arts Center, that's center core of the building. And here on the north side of the gym is done. The center section is done. There's a couple small areas. Masons are way ahead of everybody. They took real advantage of other people not being in the way, especially on the eastern half of the building, those big mass, massive spaces like the gym, the stage, the auditorium. They got the heck out of uh, really went to work hard and uh, uh, got way ahead of the schedule uh, on a lot of this. Interior mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire protection is underway already in Area B, which is the humanities wing, already underway in the kitchen. The gymnasium, they are moving into the corridor between the gym and the auditorium. That next real big focus is going to be that two-story humanities wing, and they're going to split a separate crew, everybody is, and they'll be moving into different parts of the building at the same time, like finishing up in the gym, moving into the auditorium. Student parking lot, the curbs are in, sight lighting is roughed in, stone is down, pavers are scheduled for tomorrow. So, which is huge for us because once that's paved, that stone lot that's where everybody has been parking, where everybody walks all the way, they can make them carry their tools because they want them parking up against the building. Then they got to carry them back and they go for break and they go for lunch and it's been a real uh, challenge for everybody. That's all going to be moving. They'll be moving into uh, that new lot and everybody's life is going to be a little easier. This is an aerial shot. From, if you could picture yourself above the bleachers in the stadium looking due west, uh, right in front of us at the bottom with that open area is the locker area. To the left is the music department. Straight ahead, that big section of roofing is the gym. To the left is the stage and the auditorium. The next section of right in the center towards the top is the center, uh, center of core of the building that houses the kitchen, some of the mechanical rooms some of those support spaces, and way at the top on the left-hand side is that humanities wing, the two-story academic area. You can see the crane sticking up. This picture was taken the same day the steel arrived, first arrived for A, which is the stem wing, that steel started to go up that same day. Once the steel shows up, it goes up very, very quickly. And then everybody starts uh, crawling over the building to get the rest of the areas going. That is, if you can imagine yourself between this building and the school, up in the air, looking towards the back of the kitchen, looking into the mechanical room, which is that lower roof, and the gymnasium, auditorium, and stage in the distance. These are the steel studs and the uh, exterior sheathing that has already uh, gone up on the humanities wing. That's the auditorium and the stage in the background. These steel studs go up very, very quickly. And the only thing that goes up quicker than those studs is that white, dense glass sheathing. Once that sheathing is up and the roof is on, we consider ourselves out of the weather, even though the windows may not be in, because we could always temporarily close them in. And that's a big milestone on any project. I apologize for how dim this picture is, but you have your back to the auditorium, you're looking west, and that's looking into the center performing arts, that center gathering area, to the right is the kitchen, and off in the distance are the two academic wings. The steel went up, again, the steel went up very quickly, as is the case with most structural steel. Uh, they're still working on detailing the decking, where it has to be welded, and it has to be inspected, that roof, and once that takes place, we right away, we get the roofing material delivered, and we get it going. Uh, looks like a boring picture. These are the roof drains in the gym. I love this picture because it tells me we are completely out of the weather here. It doesn't matter what we get in terms of rain or weather or anything, we're not going to get any water in this gym. And that becomes important because these gyms, they're very large spaces and they become staging spaces for all the material, all the equipment, uh, the one single large, large area in the building. Uh, just the electrical, uh, the pull boxes for the light poles uh, in the uh, student parking lot. That was a scramble towards the end, but the electricians really stepped up, got it done. All the underground in the kitchen. This does not do, this picture does not do justice to how much utility was underground in this area. This is the 
west end of the humanities wing. They had already turned the corner with the steel studs. That's all sheeted now, as well as about half of the wall up, up facing south, facing the existing school. This is the kitchen, and part of the performing arts area, they're just prepped it, getting it ready for pouring <coughs> this clean wire mesh. That's the actual concrete pour. Uh, doesn't look like much, but because of all the obstructions, a lot of this work had to be done by hand. They would normally have two or three riding uh, power trowels with big double paddles, uh, probably half the size of your desks there. They couldn't have any of that here because of all the penetrations. They needed uh, nine finishers. A lot of work went into that. Uh, Longfellow Elementary School, <coughs> as we've mentioned in the past, is ahead of North and South and the, uh, and the other projects. Uh, because of the early opening that we thought we were aiming for, it got a lot more attention. All the structural steel there at Longfellow is done except for a temporary opening in the HVAC to, to allow some equipment to be dropped to the second floor. That equipment arrived today. Uh, the structural steel guys are all going to be back a week from today. We put up, I think there's two or three beams up there, get the rest of the decking in place, and then we can get the roofer in there and get completely out of the weather that entire building. Roof is done everywhere there, with the exception of that temporary opening that we left for the HVAC equipment. All the masonry for the K1 wing, which is the northern wing, grades K1, is done. Windows are in, brick is clean, parapet is on. If you drove there today, you would see the building exactly the way it's going to look when it's completely done, with the exception of the storefront, which is the main door. <coughs> the main door is going in there. Those are due to arrive a week from today. But the quality of the work there at all the buildings were very clean, especially the masonry. They've done a First of all, the architect did a good job designing it. It's easy to just say, give me flat break everywhere. But they stepped this back and gave it some shadow and gave it some depth and it really came out nice. Mason uh, veneer is done in Area B. Area B is the administrative, it houses a lot of the administrative offices and administrative spaces at the school, as well as part of the uh, that center core with the spiral staircase that goes up. All that masonry is in, the windows are all in. The only thing that's not done is masonry standpoint is they've got to come back and they've got to clean the brick. Great two to five story wing, that's on the east half of the building. On the north half of the building and the east half, on the east side of the building, I'm sorry, all that veneer is done. They turn the corner about two thirds of the south of the veneer is done. There's a few sections of steel studs and exterior sheathing, specifically in student dining, still has to go up. That's underway, they got back on that today. And then the masons are just gonna follow them right out. Uh, we don't see any any uh, reason that, that all the masonry on that entire building uh, should not be done by the end of this month. Uh, we're on track for that. And, uh, and really, as we said, it really does look good. Drywall and a K whip, K1 wing, it's hung, tape, finished, it's primed. Um, the second floor primer, body paint, or filler paint is done. And probably tomorrow they're going to be starting the final coat of paint in that entire wing. It's really moving very quickly. Uh, storefronts, the two storefronts, that's the big aluminum doors and windows on the north side and the other side that faces the existing building. Those uh, are due to arrive a week from today. Casework, which is all the furniture, I'm sorry, not the furniture, the cabinetry and the countertops, the built-in uh, uh, cabinetry casework all arrives two weeks from today. So. In a minute, we're going to see floor finishes, drop grid ceiling is going to be going in, above ceiling rough ends will probably 95% done. They'll be running around with a screwdriver and a paintbrush in that wing for probably another month or so, month and a half. Uh, but once uh, once we get the painting done and the casework done and the floor folks show up, uh, we're going to probably start to limit traffic going in there because there'll be people like me walking around outside, walking around the building, and I'll be carrying mud throughout that building, and then I'll get yelled at by our <laughs> superintendent. Uh, now this is my superintendent, neither of which I'm not yelling. <laughs> so uh, that's moving along very well at uh, Longfellow. We're going to get concrete curbs and sidewalks, as well as topsoil and grass in this season on the north and east sides of that building. We're not going to do anything on the south and west side. There's just too much traffic. 
Uh, once the veneer is done, we might think about the south side of the building, but we're going to play that by ear and see uh, how the weather holds out and how everybody is circulating around the building. And uh, as is the case at North, the level of uh, quality of the work here is very high. We're very pleased with it. We're fine schedule-wise. Everybody seems to be working together cooperatively. There's a lot of trading that goes on back and forth between contractors on this project. There's a lift on the job. Somebody else needs it. They'll say, can I use your lift for an hour? Can you give me an operator? Can you work for four hours? And they all work this out amongst themselves. It works, it works very well. So we're very pleased with that. In terms of the photographs, uh, Obviously, this is the new building towards the bottom of the picture. And again, you can see the only area that is not roofed is that very center section. We had to wait until the HVAC equipment gets dropped in there. And once that's done and taken care of, then we get, like I say, a week from today, the steel guys will be back to complete that. That's looking um, from the top. If you could get on top of the existing building, looking towards the administrative offices, you can see the yellow insulation and the towers for the masons, all that is gone. The windows are in, the masonry is done. Uh, it's uh, actually, I think it's even clean. The brick, they actually get in there and scrub the brick, wash it, put the power washer, get all the uh, leftover order and everything off of there. Uh, the windows, this is in the D-wing, the two-story grades, two to five wing. Windows are going in. You can see the insulation, that yellow insulation that's sprayed. Uh, that's what's gone on all the exterior walls. It's going to be a very efficient building from an energy standpoint. I'm sure Bill will be happy about that. Uh, you can't really tell here, but this, this is looking uh, at the two at the one-story grades K1 wing. All the trim is on the roof. I urge you to drive, drive past it when you leave here. It's still light out. You'll see it. It really, it really looks pretty. The architects did a good job uh, designing that for us. Duct work in the kitchen. If you on the left, that would be the opening going from the kitchen into the student dining. Duct work is going up everywhere, including the uh, main hood over the cook line. Uh, that's almost done, with the exception of the welded duct, which we are working with the uh, OED students at the high school. They did all the drawings. They're going to they're trying to figure out if they can fit it into their schedule to actually weld that duct for us, give us the pieces, and then we're going to take those to the contractor. Uh, if it all works out, everybody will benefit from it. We'll save a couple bucks for the project, we'll save a couple dollars. The high school students love that kind of thing because they actually get to contribute to the construction. We're trying to work that out at North as well. This is uh, looking south towards the student dining area in uh, the uh, K1 wing. Drywall is all done, soffits in place up above us. The only thing that's not done here, the doors are not in, the ceiling's not in. Everything else you see here is exactly what you can see when the project is done. It looks like finished paint, it gets one more coat. The utilities up above, uh, this is just west, yes, just west of the administrative area. The four pipe system, that's in there. There's an awful lot of utilities that go into these buildings. The hydronic lines, the plumbing lines, the fire sprinkler lines, the roof drains, and that, that just deals with water. Forget the ductwork ventilation, the exhaust, uh, technology, fire sprinklers. This is what that soffit looked like and the drywall looked like before it was painted. To the left, that yellow piece of equipment is half in just at the edge of one of those storefronts that is going to be facing the existing building that goes in uh, a week from today, start to go in a week from today. That same area looking towards the soffit, this is the collaborative area, the K1 wing. Um, I would say probably a week from now, this could be virtually empty because the casework is going to be arriving and we don't want anything in the way. This is our gymnasium, again, one of the large areas. A week ago, today, this gym was full of stuff. HVAC equipment, pallets of fittings, 22 foot lengths of hydronic four and six inch iron pipe, awful lot of plumbing fittings. Everybody was in here. We had to get them all out of there so we could get this uh, block seal, which is like the, the very, very thick, heavy primer that you put on block walls before you paint. Um, and that's Longfellow. South High School. I got a primer and, with John. And I'm sorry, uh, north, north is scheduled to yes. open on okay. time. Yeah, let's talk about that. North, uh, we're going to open on time. Uh, 
Um, we, are, we are working weekends. We did not work this weekend because everybody thought it was going to rain. And it didn't rain in East Lake where I was until 4.30 in the afternoon. I was not happy. I let everybody know that this morning. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're on. We're, we have a schedule that shows we're going to finish on time. We'll be out of it. And as normally happens with these projects, we're going to be running around that last week. Screwdriver, paintbrush, touching things up, moving this over here, and repairing that, whatever it takes, but we're going to get you in there. That's the plan. That's what we're shooting for. We have a schedule that shows that Longfellow is a bit more relaxed, uh, but we're going to be out of there for this, uh, I want to say, the end of April, beginning of end of March, beginning of April uh, at the latest. Now, that doesn't mean we're done because we've got to come back after school's out in the summer. We've got to abate. Get rid of all the hazardous material, the uh, asbestos, and then get in there and demolish the building. So it's it's really going to be a tough push at Longfellow even next summer, which is why we're trying to get some of these walks and some of the landscaping and some of the curbs, the sight lighting, whatever we can this summer, uh, get it done. We we moved up the final water line because uh, the fire sprinkler contractor was not going to get an occupancy permit. We were not going to get an occupancy permit without the fire system being done. We weren't going to get that until that water line was hot enough. And the site water line loop was completed. So we changed the schedule around. Instead of doing it next spring, we did it this summer. And that worked very well. We're done with that. So uh, in terms of schedule, as we, we like to say at these core meetings, we are confident, but we are always concerned. So we. We worry about a lot of things, um, and because of that, we're confident we're going to make that schedule. South High School, uh, Area A, which is the two-story <coughs> academic area, bricks and air is about 95% completed. Actually, it was very good. Windows are being installed when I was there today. Still, they are going in. Uh, the glass is for Once that frame is in, the glass comes later, but the frames are in, so you're very close to having that completely enclosed uh, in terms of 100% closed and out of the weather. MEPs, which are mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, rough-ins in that area, about 90% complete. These notes, John wrote these notes Friday, and the place was crawling with people this, uh, this afternoon when I got them, so you may even be farther than that. Drywall and air will be starting in the next couple weeks. Uh, so you will see these spaces transform very, very quickly. Area 2, 6, and 7, that's the competition gym. That pre-engineered uh, metal building, steel erection, that's up. Roof panels, they were short a couple of uh, some clips that they needed to actually lock these roof panels on to complete it. Those arrived today, so John thinks in the next week and a half, two weeks, that entire roof structure will be in place, as well as the exterior panels. So that competition gym will be 100% out of the web. Those buildings go up very, very quickly once they show up and start to get erected. The competition, which is the south, uh, or oh, I'm sorry, the competition floor, the slab itself is poor. That's, uh, that's a place that actually looks very good. And that has become a staging area, like, like similar to North and similar to Longfellow. Field House, which is just south of that, that slab, uh, slab operated concrete, is scheduled for the next few weeks. They still got to get in there and do some fine grading get the uh, uh, clean down, get the mesh down, and then they'll be put pouring concrete. Again, another large area that uh, everybody's going to take advantage of. Uh, pool A walls are done. They were working on the final form work today. That's supposed to be poured next week. Uh, pool B work is, is probably not going to start for a couple of weeks. That's a small waiting pool, just south of the big competition pool. And that still has to be excavated. Once they get to one pool, it's a big one on the north side, A, pool A, W, and south. Area three, exterior sheathing is done. All the roof blocking, the RTU, those are mechanical equipment. All the curves on the roof are done. That's moving, according to John, that's moving up along very well. Interior framing and the mechanical electrical rough ends, that's going on in the first floor. It's going on throughout that building. If you walk through that, if you're not careful, you'll closing you into the stud wall. <laughs> Area four, the steel deck is going to be done next week. That brick veneer is ongoing. The slab, the concrete was poured. That all looks good. Area five, you know, it's so funny reading this, but you can, you can certainly read it. 
Um, you know, the, the long and short of it is John and that entire team in South have taken a very complicated process. And they haven't made it easy, but they're getting it all done. There have been a lot of challenges there. I'm sure you're, you're aware of some of the uh, some of the hiccups with the soil and some of the, the soil that was inappropriate that had to be taken out. Kind of put a couple uh, couple areas behind schedule and made it challenging, but they've made all that time up, and it's uh, that part of the, the project seems to be going uh, seems seems to be going pretty well. Area nine is the uh, senior center. That's all a wood, wood frame. That building came out panelized, so they were not cutting studs and building walls on site. They had huge sections of wall that were already framed, came on a truck, they lifted it off, set it on, on a slab, bolted the place, and it just went along. So that's going very well. The interior mechanical rough fins are on the way. The veneer on the outside, that uh, uh, water line, that, that short section of veneer is in place. The hardy board, which is a metal cementitious siding, is on site. It's going to start going in. Uh, area 8 is the YMCA. That framing is done, including the second floor decking. The roof decking, and there's some detail work that's still underway. Uh, that slab on deck, which is the upper deck, as well as the running track, is scheduled to be poured towards the middle of this month. Uh, in terms of pictures, um, you are directly above the northern parking lot looking southwest. You can see the football field out in the distance. Uh, you can see an awful lot of this roof is done. The only, there's that uh, section in the upper middle, pit, middle uh, section of the picture, that's the YMCA where the steel frame is up. The decking is going on. Uh, that's the one last area John expects to get the roof done. Uh, roof uh, frame, roof seat put on, in, uh, on the uh, entire complex. The media of the senior center is that light yellow looking area. That's that now looks white because the roof is on. That's black here. The two-story area one, two-story academic wing, it's a lot farther along now. There's a lot less insulation visible and a lot more brickwork is finished. <coughs> this is actually looking uh, farther south uh, and around the corner towards the kitchen and the mechanical areas. Uh, on the on the inside, you're probably on the north side looking south or southwest with this picture. Uh, this veneer is probably going to be underway. Uh, they're just going to continue all the way across from that two-story wing academic area and just follow all the way across. Our music room is pretty much uh, off frame. They need the roof deck, they need the storefront, and that, that'll be completely out of the weather. They'll start working on the interior finishes. This is area five, which is the um, student dining, getting ready to pour the concrete. All the visqueen is down, the wire mesh is down, and they're just getting, uh, as I said, getting ready to pour the slab on grade. The field house, well, I'm sorry, this is the competition gym. It's been poured. Uh, this is the one area where they were looked, they had to get the clips for the roof that arrived today. This whole area, everybody pretty much divvies up the floor space amongst themselves. Uh, who can put what where so that it doesn't become just a big mess. Uh, but everybody, it's almost self-policing. They, they realize that if they encroach in somebody else's area, they're liable to find a pile of pipe. Instead of being orderly, it's not going to spread all over the place. So it all works pretty well. Field house, just south of the competition gym. That's scheduled. Uh, I know they've already started uh, uh, to lay out and get shoot some grades. They'll be getting the fine grade of the soil and uh, the, uh, the dirt, and then they'll be getting their plastic, the this clean, the wire mesh, and they'll get that poured. I think this is scheduled to be poured before the end of October. I wish we had the kind of space at North Longfellow, space, especially at Longfellow. It's really a premium. This is the A pool. Uh, this will be poured, I think it's going to be poured, uh, if not the end of this week, the beginning of the following week. The carpenters were there uh, just finishing the forms when it goes from the shallow part of the pool into the deep part of the pool. YMCA, all the steel decking. Uh, the steel decking is up on the roof, all of it is up. It's just not spread out, it's not in place. But what they do is they get it off frame while the frame is there. They get all that steel decking up on the roof, spread it out in piles, and then when it's uh, 
and then they come back with a detailed include, spread each individual piece out, put it where it belongs, weld it in place, screw, the two, uh, screw all the metal decking together, get your angles up on the outside of the building, and then the roofer comes in and goes to work. This building is going to take shape very, very quickly. I, my understanding is it's metal siding, um, and it's insulated siding, so it goes up very, very quickly. Senior center, this roof is now being finished. As you can see, it's, uh, again, I apologize for the quality of the picture, but if you drive around that, you'll see that brick veneer. It's up about three and a half, four feet. It's done. Flashings are in place, right to the bottom of the window, the windowsill, and then the rest of that is a cementitious metal siding. Uh, John says he's going to be done on time, uh, and I believe he is. They're really, they're, they're really, well, they're, they're ahead of North for sure. I'm not sure they're keeping up with Longfellow, but Longfellow, as I said earlier, really got the benefit of everybody's focus way up front because we're looking at a spring move, uh, which has now been pushed to the uh, summer, but of course, still busy dust. But South is uh, really coming along well, and I'm, I'm impressed with the quality of the work there. We always worry when we recommend, as, as a construction manager, we, we worry about some of the trades that we recommend, you never know what you're going to end up with in the air because that's not something, if it isn't done well, if it's done poorly, it's not something you can fix easily. If somebody messes up the paint job in the corridors, that's okay. Everybody bites the bullet, you make the repairs, and you paint it again. Veneer, brick veneer, is not that way at all. Concrete, not that way at all. So that is not the case here. We're getting pretty high quality work in all these buildings, so we're pretty pleased with it. I talked with Mike Terry, he's the project manager on the Board of Education office today. Uh, they are working from the top down. So on the fifth floor, the drywall finishing is in, in, in process in some of the rooms, and some of the other rooms are already painted. So uh, I would think in the next week, week and a half, they'll be completely finished with the drywall on that top floor, and they'll be working their way down, as I said, and the, the painters are just going to chase everybody out of there, uh, going down, and then they'll casework guys will be up there. But again, those built-in counters and cabinets and such. Fourth floor, exterior windows and drywall, that's underway. Uh, third floor, the exterior insulation, that's that sprayed insulation that we saw. The vapor barrier, you'll see that in the picture later on. It looks like aluminum foil. Uh, it is aluminum, but it's a little heavier than what uh, we would generally see at home. Restroom, interior framing, the ex uh, of the walls, steel studs, that's on underway. Second floor, as well as still parts of the first floor, there's fireproofing, uh, that spray fireproofing, really messy, but you have to have it in this building because of the fire rating. That's uh, ongoing. First floor, some of the in-wall electrical rough-in is already uh, underway. And then, again, he's working from the top down. First floor, east corridor, it's tough to see, but it looks like really fuzzy stuff on the uh, uh, the structural steel members, that's the fireproofing. Water lines, that's a hot and cold water line, as well as the return lines are already in place. You'll see a picture later on farther up the building on, on the, uh, I believe, the fourth floor, certainly the fifth floor, where all those pipes are completely insulated. Steel studs are up, which you can't see in this picture unless you really look close, because you can see the conduit of steel studs on the right hand wall. That's the electrical that's underway. Second floor, uh, you can see they plastic, they cover everything. They cover the floor, they cover the walls with this and everything because this is a very messy process, fireproofing. Uh, it comes out in a very sticky, what do I call it, oatmeal. There you go. With fiber in it. Not not anything you want to get on you. And it's tough to get off of anything because it's it's got a, a, a tacking, like a glue product in it. Because it's got a stick. Wherever it goes, it's got a stick. It's got, and it's got a cure. So you can't just spray it and then get in there and bounce around on it the next day because parts of it will fall off. You have to let it cure and dry. And then, you, then the only way to get it off is with a pry bar. Uh, very messy, but you have to do it. That is a vapor barrier that goes on the outside of the building. It looks like aluminum foil. It's exactly what it is, a little thicker. Uh, the walls get insulated first, then this goes on. Then it gets drywall. And you can see um, on the fourth floor, that's the conference room that's being drywalled. And you can see the windows. Uh, they take and they cut that in the next pattern and they 
fold the pieces into the door, into the window jams, the top and the bottom, and then they return the drywall so you have a vapor barrier on all the exterior surfaces of that building. Fourth floor west corridor, you can see the pipes are all insulated, the ductwork is up in place, uh, a lot of the electrical is done here, this is ready to drywall. And you can actually see, this is the uh, east corridor, excuse me, on the fourth floor. You can see the dry, some of that drywall is actually near the way it's starting. Reception area, this happens to be on the fifth floor. There's, a, I guess, a reception area on east, each floor. This is on the fifth floor because you can see the drywall's up. It's taped, it's primed. Some of it's even uh, being painted already. Conference room on the fifth floor, you can barely tell with this picture, but I can tell from mine. Window frames are painted. Walls are painted. Uh, the next step here would be to put in the drop dead ceiling grid, get the flooring, get the floor covering, the casework to get out of the way so you guys can get in there and start laying your meetings there. Again, the fifth floor east corridor, a lot of that painting is done. You've got, still got to come back. They've got to get door trim and such. The elevator frames have to be painted. The flooring's got to go in. But they're ready, very, very close to being ready for the drop grid ceiling. Main, uh, goes a long way towards making the space look like it's done. And I'm sorry that I talked so long. Well, thank you. So, if you have any questions, uh, Mike says he's swept a few days at the board office. They're going to make those days up. They've got guys that are committed to contractors, committed to work on Saturdays, and they're committed to getting a couple more trade people in those critical, critical path areas. So, uh, they're, they're going to be finishing on time. Again. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Anybody have any? It's very well, impressive. I, I know sorry. it's your job, but it's just impressive how you can just say all that stuff, know all that stuff. It's very impressive. And thank you, thank you so much. You. We're glad you're in a position to help us. Thank you. For sure. Uh, just a, a note on the elevators um, at Central Office. There was some debate back and forth. They were state certified, but some debate back and forth as to whether or not the local uh, building inspectors, is that fair to say, yeah. fire marshal, yeah. were going to sign off on those elevators because of this thing called a recall. Um, but they did sign off on that. Um, they all, but the, the caution I'll say to the board, um, and we know administratively, those are the original elevators. and. We are certainly on borrowed time on those elevators, and it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 230,000, I believe. Right. Is that correct, Patrick? Yes. You were in that meeting. Yeah, during five stop elevators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we know that that's coming. So we're going to put money away each year, and because we know that's coming, and then we'll attack one elevator, make that transition, hopefully be able to go two more years, and then do the other elevator. But that that is coming. If we're not, we are sort of kicking the can down the road, but we're kicking the can down so that we can save and chunk it off. So what you're saying is we should use the steps when we come to that building. <laughs> All of well, you can yeah. use the steps. Well, be <laughs> I'll bring the can glass over. Um, and I do, I do want to give kudos to Lori Klanowski there in the back. Um, Lori's doing her very busy job, plus she is... Um, Heading up the mission of all the furniture purchases for um, for Central Office, um, and that's a huge endeavor. Pam Claire is helping, assisting, uh, but Lori's leading that. Um, and Jean has done it in several other buildings. She also has great taste, but she's just we wanted her to focus on as you you saw all the things that's going on in the curriculum department. So Lori's been really double two jobs. So I appreciate that very much. I know you're busy and working very hard. And keeping us within our budget or doing the very best we can. Furniture is expensive. And I will give a shout out to Al Avery, who's done a fabulous job for us driving those prices down. How much has he saved us approximately? Thousands and thousands. Really, he's done a really good job. I mean, he's just, the guy's got a knack for it. Um, so he's done a great job in that area. Now it's William, I believe, right? Yes. Well, we haven't proved the minutes. Thank you so much. Anybody else who'd like to leave?
we don't we don't mind we understand okay item two the minutes I'm looking for approval of the minutes from the meeting of September 10th 2018 is there a motion Madam President, Mrs. Zern. I will approve the minutes to a approval minutes of September 10, 2018. Thank you, Mrs. Zern. Is there a second? I will second that. Thank you, Mrs. Brzezinski. It's been moved and accept and seconded that we approve the minutes of the meeting September 10, 2018. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Parkinson, will you call the roll? Mrs. Zern? Yes. Mrs. Brzezinski? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Dr. Field? Yes. Yes, motion is carried. <coughs> Mr. Parkinson. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. I too will adjust the agenda slightly if Madam President doesn't mind. Uh, put the forecast up first. That's fine with me. Oh, you got okay. bubbles. Bubbles. <laughs> nice. Mind to have his interview. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to go through the revenue. I'm going to go through how this document was constructed. I'll go through the revenues and then, then I'll. Okay, numbers are just estimates, and five minutes from now will probably change. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. <laughs> they changed. Okay, what uh, Mr. Thompson and I have been doing throughout all of our um, meetings with the various PTA and PTO organizations is emphasizing bonds are for buildings and levies are for learning. They are controlled by two separate sections of the Ohio Revised Code. 3318, bonds, 5705, levies. They can never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever be intermingled. It is illegal. They are completely separate uh, independent funds that where the expenses are tracked. And we're audited on this uh, every year. <clears throat> so the rumors that are going around saying, well, you're building all these new buildings. How could you possibly be running out of money? Well, this is why. 3318, after the projects are done, that each fifth fund will have zero dollars, as it should. That's how uh, all the bonds work. 5705 for the levies. Okay. The bright yellow line is our revenues with renewals. The bright green line is if the renewals, all the renewals should fail. So you can kind of see revenues are flat, and that's because of House Bill 920. As property values go up, our <clears throat> the tax rates go down and we collect the exact same number of dollars. We cannot get any new money whatsoever of any kind unless we pass the levy. So our revenue graph, just like every other school district, is going to be perfectly flat. Okay, <clears throat> so how do we come up with uh, property taxes? Everything is based on evaluations. <clears throat> so here, what I wanted to show were Valuation is evaluation history. Back in 06, our valuation was nearly $2 billion. And you can see kind of two steep drops. Well, it's a result of a couple of things. <clears throat> Back in 2009, the state uh, passed a law where they said districts were not, or anybody, were not allowed to tax furniture, equipment, machinery, and inventory. <clears throat> the second big drop is the recession. And then we've kind of flattened out ever since the recession. But, as you saw in the first slide, our revenues were flat, even though this graph shows our valuations uh, going down by uh, $500 million. We're about 1.53 right now. That was at almost $2 billion. So, <clears throat> we'll split the taxes up into two components. We have class two, business and industry, class one, residential and agriculture. This has been the change in valuation over the last six years. <clears throat> Meaning, in 2012, values for business and industry have went down by 12.5%. And they've continued to decline. But, <clears throat> as you see from the graph, they have declined slightly less and less and less. For the purpose of the forecast right now, I'm going to assume that they'll probably tick up about a quarter percent, but not a whole lot. I'm still waiting for what's called a Schedule A from the County Auditor's Office, and now I'll get that document in December. But for, for right now, I'm going to assume that they'll probably get onto the positive side. <clears throat> the collection rates, 
uh, have steadily improved as the economy has improved. I'm assuming 90.3 uh, tax rate, and that's nothing more than the average of those numbers in this graph. So the last five years, I just took the average and said, okay, this is about what we're going to collect. <clears throat> Moving on to class one, which are basically homes. Big drop in 2012, and then it flattened out. Uh, very little negative, very little positive. So, how do I know what values are going to be in 2019? Well, the, the, the Ohio Department of Taxation publishes a report called the Median Market to Price Ratio. So I know over the last uh, 13 years what the median sales price of the homes have been in the school district. So before the recession, they were about $140,000. They peaked, and then you can see the recession hit, and home values went way down. 2018, we're at about the same level we were back in 2005. So home values have basically recovered. So the county auditor does not dictate what the values are going to be. That's actually set by the Department of Taxation. It's called the Bureau of, of um, uh, shoot, not just lost, but anyways. There's a group of bureaucrats within the Department of Taxation that actually tell the county auditors what the value is going to be, up or down. The county send them this information. So what this is telling me is that the, the prices of homes, as recorded by the county auditor's office, are lower than what they're actually selling at. <clears throat> so in Eastlake, the, the county auditor uh, through the Department of Taxation is going to say the values are going to have to come up by 4.6%, in Willoughby, 9%, Willoughby Hills, 10 and in Willowick, about 2.5%. <clears throat> so that's telling me that probably the residential piece of the valuations, the values are going to come up 6%, but we know we're not going to gain any money from that. Our revenues are going to stay flat, but values are going to come up. So I'm going to guess that probably we'll see residential values go up somewhere around 6% if you kind of average all that stuff out. We have about 802 homes for sale. The last report that I looked at, median home value of about 147. <clears throat> and you can see with the economy recovering, home values have steadily climbed within the school district. <clears throat> Collection rates. Residential values, uh, residents, very good, 99.4%. I did the same thing I did with class two. I took all the collection rates from the past five years, averaged it, and got about 99.4%. Delinquency collections, <coughs> these are businesses and uh, residences who are who were behind on the taxes that have now paid up. And as you can see, it, it, it climbed a little bit, and then it's dropping off a little bit, about two, Two point million dollars in 2018. For the purpose of the forecast, I'm going to assume just a little bit less because the trend has been going down. That we're going to get 1.8 million dollars coming in on top of what our collections are from the rates and values. Okay, this November we have two renewal levies on the ballot. First one, issue four. This raises about 7.6 million dollars. This levy, this levy alone, will not raise people's taxes. In in and of itself. This particular levy does not raise people's taxes. <clears throat> it stays exactly the same. Issue five, this is a 10-year levy, generates almost six million dollars, same thing. This levy, this one levy is not gonna raise your taxes. It stays exactly the same. So together, these two levies represent 14% of our revenue budget, which is significant. 14% of our revenue went away in catastrophic. We would have to make drastic changes in our budgets to, to accommodate that kind of cut. <clears throat> this is our renewal cycle. Uh, so I just took the five-year forecast and I, I kind of laid out the renewal levies that are going to take place within the five-year forecast. Now there's one outlier in 2024. But <clears throat> for the next five, six years, we have to renew levies seven times. And that is because what, is, uh, what we collect are 
all emergency levies. We have zero continuing levies except for those that are prior to 1976. And after 1976 have been emergency levies, and we have five of them. And we have to renew five of those levies seven times in the next six years. Over the next 20 years, we're on the ballot 17 times just to keep our funding flat. 17 times. <clears throat> As I spoke to, this is our millage. Those are all the, the levies that were passed prior to 1976, the effective rate is 18.9, and that's a good example of House Bill 920. When those levies were passed, we were collecting 32 and a half mills, but as the value has gone up, the rates have come down. We collect the same amount of money. Emergency levies work a little bit different. They collect the same dollar amount. <clears throat> if, if Amazon were to build their giant warehouse that they did in Warrensville Heights, in this school district, we would see no new money. Same amount of money. They would be paying new taxes to us, yes, but they would drive down all the business taxes that all the other businesses pay, and we'd get the same money. Okay, a lot of questions about property taxes, what's on my property tax bill. Well, schools are just one component. We make up about 66 or 64 voted mills out of all of the millage that is collected on somebody's property tax bill. The county collects 18.3, and here are all the things that the county collects. So if somebody's property tax bill goes up, <clears throat> you have all of these components that may or may change, may or may not change, or may or may not go up, uh, things that are on the ballot for all sorts of things. And then if you live in a particular municipality, not that all of these municipalities would be on the tax bill, it depends on where you live, but you, if you're in Way Hill, it's 22.2 mills. If you're in Willowick, it's 19 and a half mills. On top of everything the, the county collects, and then of course, on top of what the school collects. <clears throat> this is a very telling graph. This is our tangible personal property collections. They have tanked. In 2006, we collected $12 million. Tangible personal property tax. <clears throat> uh, first energy plan, railroads, telephone poles, things like that. Telecommunications, yes. trash cans, anything, right? Anything that can be taxed is tangible personal property tax. Except for furniture, fixtures, inventory, machinery. Okay. That piece went away. That's what I'm saying. That was phased out. That was completely phased out. So that's a contributing factor that's to that. That's part of what's contributing. That yes. used to be taxed. Yes. So that plunge. Is that initial plunge, that roller coaster plunge, is due to that tax being wiped away. <clears throat> the next plunge, right before it dips up, is First Energy. So First Energy closed the, the East Lake plant. They've converted it to natural gas. They call these uh, uh, synchronized condensers. And supposedly they're the, the, the size of a, a small bungalow that you might see in East Lake or Willowick. There's four of them. Steve and I, along with District Legal Council, argued, along with the county auditor, the, the county auditor's office, very helpful, argued that those, those machines have value. And we were ultimately successful. So that second bump is First Energy agreeing with the school district and the county saying, yes, there is value to those machines. And it went up. A tune of about $100 million yes so the case was first energy saying it was worth five million dollars i told them look i am i'm not the smartest tech uh, accountant in the world but you guys don't sink a hundred million dollars into four machines and say it's not worth anything somebody did a return on investment and to convince the the corporate guys we should sink a hundred million dollars into this plan i don't i can't pretend to do that math but somebody did the math and you can't tell me it's zero there's no way that was their contention. <clears throat> so we were successful. We got the, the values way up, which resulted in collections coming back to the school district. <clears throat> this July, I received a letter from the county and our auditor's office that says, First Energy is going to devalue their plan once again and to expect roughly $700,000 to come away in collections, be taken away. 
I, I did that. So I had already set a budget for the school board to consider and they approved. And that included that $700,000 gone, just wiped out, gone. So that second slope is my estimate of where I think probably First Energy is going to wind up. Now, we'll probably appeal, most likely. Uh, but for now, let's just say, assume worst case scenario, those values go back down into the tank. Uh, so revenue collections are going to go down with it. This is the uh, first energy case. <clears throat> this is the change in value. So I'm estimating that the value that they have set yesterday is going to probably decrease by 20% over the next five years. <clears throat> State funding. Well, we're going to get a new governor, and you know, as Mr. Thompson alluded to about uh, you know, grading changing, curriculum changing, state standards changing, the state will probably change the fund formula again. So, regardless who gets in, I'm assuming that whatever is in place today is in place for the next five years. But of course, who knows what the new governor is going to want to do? Is that person going to want to change the formula? Is that person going to want to make significant changes? I, I have no idea. So we'll just leave well enough alone for now. <clears throat> okay. State funding is made up of two components. Butts and seats and valuation. <clears throat> Take a look at enrollment. Over the last 10 years, we've lost about 9.5% of our students. Over the last five, about 4.7. The last three, about one. So what this tells me is, although we're losing students, it's getting better. Our, our enrollment losses are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. <clears throat> so what I did was I assumed about a half percent loss, which is about the average of the last two years. And I assumed that for the next five. <clears throat> so basically just taking those changes and just assuming a trend of a minus five percent. <clears throat> the other components that are in the state funding that are that aren't in the funding formula, catastrophic aid, preschool support, transportation support, I made those uh, constant. The casino money, um, I'm gonna keep that. Uh, it rolls with enrollment. The $52, I didn't change. So whatever our enrollment is next year, it's times 52, the year after times 52. Uh, the growth cap is <clears throat> 3%, meaning if the funding formula says, Will be is going will be like is going to get eight percent more money. The state funding formula cash is at three percent, so we cannot get any more money than the previous year um, beyond three percent. <clears throat> Moving on to homestead rollback, it's a straight calculation off of um, residential property, twelve and a half percent. So whatever the forecast is for the residential property over the next five years, uh, straight to twelve and a half percent calculation. <clears throat> Just a note with the legislative change in 2013, the state passed law that said no more reimbursements from the state of Ohio on new monies. So all your property tax bills, you have a 12 and a half percent reduction. <clears throat> that is reimbursed with the school district by the state of Ohio. So we get that 12 and a half percent back from Columbus. <clears throat> If we were to pass a new, any new money, we wouldn't get that 12.5%. It's, it's lost. But with renewal and substitute levies, we would continue to collect that 12.5% reimbursement. So it's something to consider if we're out for a mill. A mill doesn't generate what it used to because we've lost that 12.5% reimbursement. <clears throat> TPP reimbursements which is another huge, significant revenue loss to the school district. We used to collect almost $8.3 million from, this, from Columbus with TPP reimbursement. So I mentioned we lost the tax on furniture, fixtures, equipment, machinery, and inventory. The state made up for it. <clears throat> We're now collecting in 2019 $700,000, what we used to collect, $8.3 million. By 23, it's gone. If you convert that $8.3 million into millage, it's about five, five and a half mills. It's, it's a chunk of change. 
if we were to pass, you know, five, five and a half, we, that would generate about $8.3 million a year. That's a huge revenue loss to the school district. <clears throat> and with only one new levy in 2012, the district has absorbed that loss and obviously will continue to uh, without any money. <clears throat> Other revenue, there's a whole bunch of different components in other revenue, it's about $2.9 million. Tuition that we receive as a school district, <coughs> be relatively flat at 900,000. Fee collections, about 860. We have a TIF agreement in there, it's 98,000. Interest rates, uh, they continue to rise, so we'll continue to get a little bit of growth on interest earnings and Medicaid reimbursements. Uh, that'll grow a little bit at 1%. Here's our interest rates. <clears throat> you can see as the economy recovered, so have interest rates. Star Ohio right now is about 2.15%. I will point out that the district did not invest with Star Ohio because 0.04%, that might as well be zero. So I looked at alternative investments, and the district was, when those rates were 0.041561, we were getting 1% right around in there on average. So we were able to take advantage of different investment opportunities instead of just, okay, star house, star house, star house. So that got us a little bit more money, but it should be 0.04%. <clears throat> okay, total expenditures. So you remember the graph of revenue, flat expenses is like all households keep continuing up. Why are they going up? 80% of our budget, roughly, is people. We don't produce widgets, we don't produce anything. We produce education, and education takes a lot of people to, to, to produce. <clears throat> so within salaries uh, for the teachers, current contract language, that's the CCL, base at 1.99%, step on column, substitutes, um, their department IEP staff meetings, those are all flat, and no base increase past 2019. So the negatives that you see, do not reflect any sort of negotiations that may take place this winter that are coming up. <clears throat> Classified staff, basically the same thing. Base, substitutes, overtime, constant, no base past 2019. Administrative, <clears throat> base at same 1.99, no increase past 2019. Insurance, we are, we are self-insured. And that is highly beneficial to the school district in that, um, let's say our, our annual premiums are $1,000 per employee. We have 10 employees. Well, regardless of what happens with the actual claims, if we are fully insured, the insurance company gets all that money. Being self-insured, if our claims are low, we get to keep the savings. We get to reap those benefits. So. <clears throat> On average, we have averaged about one premium holiday a year. That's about $660,000. It just depends on you know claims and whatnot, but on average. So I have that in the fire forecast, a savings of $660,000 per year for five years. Obviously, if we don't get one, that $660,000 I got to put back into the forecast. <clears throat> Medical insurance is about 11% increase. Uh, employee contributions uh, per the collecting bargain agreement. Dental and vision are already in the medical plan, and then life insurance is 10 cents per, per thousand. Retirement per the collecting bargain agreements and a lot of revised code. Workers' comp, about 0.33%. Purchase services, you can see how I've kind of looked at past expenses and kind of guessed at what they would increase at moving forward. <coughs> Supplies, the same thing. The big thing with supplies, they do not have new textbook adoptions in this fight before guess. They're, they're very expensive. Um, roughly, textbook replacements have been about $60,000 a year. Photocopy them, Gina. <laughs> Photo -copy them, Gina. <laughs> Get them online. Get them online. Do what you need to do. Those aren't free either. <laughs> um, so that's in there. Capital expenses. <clears throat> No one-to-one uh, no -one initiatives are assumed. That's that's a fairly big uh, uh, bill to, to undertake. And unfortunately, at this point with the five-year forecast, it's it's not uh, it's not feasible to, to go ahead and move forward with that. 
any major facility repairs, we do have the PI fund and construction fund that we can take those monies from. Uh, but basically, that's that's it as far as uh, capital expenses. We do have four pieces of debt that uh, the general fund takes care of. <coughs> I will point out the 2017 COPS that was refinanced. If you brought all the savings forward to today, the net present value of savings is about $806,000. If you were to add up all the numbers over the next 20 some years, it'd be like four million bucks or something, but the net present value is about the <clears throat> Other expenses, county auditor and treasurer fees, they charge a percentage of what they collect, including delinquencies. Uh, so those will, will, will follow what um, we collect. Election expenses, of course, when we're out for new levies, as I pointed out earlier, we have to pay for those um, through the Board of Elections. Liability insurance, state exams, all the fees. So, with all that, they need, these are our actual cash balances. 2013, that was about $5.8 million. Uh, that was the um, half collections of the new levy that was passed in 2012. And then 2014, we realized the full collections of the levy that was passed in 2012. <coughs> Then we look at 19 going forward, we're about $12 million down to about minus 22. And then this is basically 10 years of history uh, with cash balances. And those those balances include all the renewal levies passed. Mm -hmm. Obviously, pretty much worse if they don't. But um, that's what we have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another person who is it's his job to know this stuff, but it's great to be able to explain it to those of us who are not as astute. Thank you, Bill. It doesn't go down. Oh, okay. Are you guys cold? Okay, good. I just, I just wondered it. if it was just us up I here. just turned it up, so hopefully, <laughs> okay. hopefully it'll get a little warmer. It is. Uh, it's it's part of the cost saving strategy, right? <laughs> yeah, or something. So um, you've heard uh, Mr. Parkinson's five-year forecast. I'm looking for a motion and a second to approve said forecast. Madam President. Mrs. Puchinski. I make a motion to approve the five-year forecast. Thank you, Mrs. Paczynski. Is there a second? Madam President. Mr. Jones. I second that motion. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we approve item 3D, the five-year forecast. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Parkinson, will you call the roll? Mrs. Paczynski? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Dr. Beal? Yes. Mrs. Zern? Yes. Mrs. Warner? Yes. Motion has carried. Mr. Parkinson, back to item A. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. The next item for your consideration is the financial report ending September 30th. The details can be found under that particular exhibit. The next item, amended appropriations. These are the amended appropriations that will be, uh, that reflect the changes uh, in the budget, uh, mostly with um, student activity accounts and um, state and federal grants. <coughs> next item, is the amended certificate of resources. This gets filed with the county <coughs> auditor's office. Um, the changes that were reflected in the permanent appropriations are the same for the resources. So whatever changes happen in a, in a particular federal grant, the revenues are matched so that the revenues and expenses um, are the same as they should be. <coughs> Item E for your consideration is the Western Reserve Agency. This is related to the RSVP federal grant program. <coughs> the monies uh, come to us, uh, but it's really that particular uh, agency, the RSVP group, that, that spends the money. Uh, so this is just on, on because we manage the money, um, house the money for them. Um, it has to come to you for consideration. This is the stop loss agreement with Medical Mutual of Ohio. Um, this is an annual item for your consideration. This has to do with the employee medical plan, uh, the contracts uh, with, that we have with Medical Mutual. 
DS Benefits, who is our consultant, has reviewed all of these documents and uh, is confident that uh, one, the documents uh, are highly favorable to the school district uh, and that we should move forward with, with these particular contracts. And the same can be said with item G. Uh, so there's, there are a couple of uh, contracts for your, uh, related to medical mutual for your consideration. <coughs> item H are purchase orders and blanket certificates. There's just, uh, there are just one uh, purchase order for your consideration <coughs> uh, to W.B. Mason. There are a couple of uh, then and now certificates, uh, Lake Health and the Lake County Historical Society, and then one to the uh, Juvenile Center. And then lastly, blanket certificates of uh, $50,000 or more. There are three for your consideration. <coughs> Item I, advance of funds. <coughs> the various funds listed under this particular resolution are being requested to be advanced out of the general fund to those particular accounts with those accounts uh, repaying the general fund sometime later this fiscal year. <coughs> Item J is return of advance and there's just one. This is the state grant related to the nursing program. They are returning their money back to the general fund. Transfer funds. This is the um, monthly item for the termination benefit fund, $75,000. Uh, looking at the expenses of this fund so far, we probably are going to maybe able to save seventy-five to one hundred fifty thousand dollars by the time we get to June. Uh, if expenses continue to trend the way they were, once I get past January, I'll probably have a better idea. Uh, the general fund could save on a transfer to, but that's the way it's looking right now. But uh, for the purpose of the forecast and the budget, all the transfers are are in those two documents. But I just want to let you guys know that probably might be able to save one or two of these transfers. Uh, item L, uh, these are transfer funds to close accounts and this is related to um, a federal grant and this is typical uh, when federal grants transition from one fiscal year to another, we close down one part of the uh, federal grant and open up a new one for the new fiscal year. And then lastly, Madam President, our gifts and donations and those items um, that were generously donated to the school district are under item I. And those conclude my reports. Thank you, Mr. Parkinson. We now move to the superintendent's reports. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Item A, of course, has been covered on our construction update and comments, unless you want to go through it again. <laughs> if not, so we'll move on. Um, I just wanted to give you a brief update on um, gradua graduation requirements. Uh, They've changed considerably from when most of us were in school, and they've changed even from what they were a year ago. So students have to gain 18 points to graduate, and these po they're points. They don't have any, this, this is not, don't be confused with credits. These are points that they're earning. And those end of course exams that you heard Gina uh, mention earlier, they can score anywhere from a one to a five, correct? And as they take those courses, it has to total 18 points. So theoretically, you could do okay on several of those tests, but still not compile enough points to graduate. You could get threes, for example, and not, and you would be short um, graduating from that, from from the points pers perspective. And this is not a, this is not an and. This is an or. So then the next or is you can get an industry credential before graduation. So the interesting, those are things like cosmetolo cosmetology, welding, medical assisting, STNA. You, might, you don't hear LPN in there because they don't take their LPN state exam until after graduation. So that doesn't help them. We don't choose when they take it. That's a state test that they sit for. So that's another potential option plus, but it's not just that alone, plus 13 points on a on a test called the work keys test. And this is essentially testing in three areas uh, to determine a student's work readiness. And those are no gimmies either. So, um, but, and then finally the last OR is an ACT score in English of 18, math 22, reading 22, or an essay. Historically, students that can hit those ACT scores or have ACT scores are not the students 
that are not passing, not hitting 18 points, um, essentially. So in 2018, and my real issue with this isn't necessarily that we're ratcheting up the standard necessarily, but it's kind of like uh, analogous to um, the referees coming into any sporting event halfway through it and saying, okay, we're going to come out for the second half, but the rules of the game are now this. Um, and that seems inherently unfair to me. And that's essentially what the legislature has done. Uh, they, in the, the, for example, I believe this, the new changes should have been walked in with the freshman class and walked up, but that's not what the state did. They came and locked these on existing students, uh, regardless of what grade they were in. Um, and they took away many, many pathways to include things to me that are logical, like a student's grade point average, uh, for example. But there are many other pathways that the state uh, allowed the graduating class of 18 to take. So based on our analysis, how does this impact Willoughby East Lake City Schools. So we're, we're, and we didn't know these pathways were officially going to be taken away until May of last year. So not kids had already scheduled, et cetera, et cetera. So we immediately took kids out of their classes uh, that had not been passing math is historically the course that trips kids up. One of those, whether it's geometry or algebra, trips them up, not, not exclusively, but primarily. Um, so that we took those kids, re modified their schedules. We actually ended up, by honestly pure luck, um, I'd like to say Chuck Murphy hit it out of the park, and you did, but it was actually lucky. I think you'd admit the substitute or the person we found to take over those math classes. Well, after the hiring season was over, um, by all accounts, is doing a phenomenal job. Uh, for example, one student in particular said. She ended up passing the test. She got the results back. She passed the test from the summer test, but has opted to stay in this remediation course because she said, math, I've never really understood math before, but the way he's teaching it, I'm understanding it. So that is a guy that we're going to hire, Mr. Murphy, one way or another. He stays on the books. Um, percent of our seniors still need points um, 27 of those students we've targeted as uh, very uh, on the very very at risk to graduate uh, that would have these are kids that would have normally graduated under normal uh, requirements uh, at South it's about 30 percent of the students um, and we have about 66 students there who are at risk of not graduating who would have historically graduated. Um, so we're doing everything we can to remediate these students. Um, uh, Rena Perchensky and I have started um, meeting and with, uh, we've, we've called the ODE, we've had a meeting with the ODE so that we understood, I think fair to say best, what is happening from the Ohio Department of Education's perspective. Uh, and so we basically, we concluded from that that um, there is a possibility that they may reinstate some of those pathways. Um, that decision will probably be made in November or December, so our window for lobbying is very narrow. Uh, and then we have um, appointments scheduled with all of our legislators, so we're going to try to impress upon them the magnitude of these changes and what they've caused. And from my perspective, the fact that we change the game in the in midstream, and that's just, um, I, I think we're doing a disservice to these students um, as a result of that. So we're doing what we can do from a state level. Superintendents are banding together and lobbying from a state level, but we wanted to do it and represent the school board um, and Will East Lake City Schools uh, so that parents know we're doing everything we can do to try to create or bring back the pathways that would, um, normally we graduate about 94, 95% of our students, not 66% or 70% of our students. Um, so that is a change. 
Um, Rena has kind of a, a, a story that I think kind of summarizes it all, so I'll turn it over to Rena. Well, before I begin, I want to let you know I got permission from the student to tell their story. There's a senior this year who received a letter in March before the heiress test in May stating that they were still one point shy for graduation requirements. The beginning of the letter that was rece received stated the class of 2019 have multiple pathways to earn a high school diploma. The parents read the letter and set it aside. There were no concerns because they knew they had a good student and was, well, you know, really what was one more point <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. They also knew there were alternative pathways. In July, the parents and student were informed by the guidance department that the spring results came back and once again the student was one point shy. They were also told that the test would be offered again in two weeks. Now the parents were in a panic because they were told that the state took away the alternative pathways in May. One of many questions to our legislators, as he just mentioned, is how does the state take away alternative pathways between junior and senior year? Any changes should be made, if they are to be made, should be with the incoming freshman class. The pathways for their child that would have easily have been achieved was one, having a 2.5 grade point average or above, and their student currently had a 3.5. The second was the student would have to have an attendance rate of 93% for their senior year. And third, possibly receive an AP credit score of three or higher. The funny thing was, at the same time the student found out in July they were shy one point, they had also received a letter that they, they had received achieved a five on the AP government test. That's as high as you can get, by the way. In addition to those pathways, there were a lot more pathways taken away, as Steve had mentioned. So imagine a student who is almost two months into summer turning the switch back on to take the test again in mid-July. The parents brought in a math tutor for four sessions as desperate measures especially since they learned that if the student did not achieve the one point again, they would have the chance to retake the test in December. When the results come back in February and the student say does not get that one point again, they will not graduate. The student could take the test again in April, but results would come back too late for the student to attend graduation. What a complete sick feeling the student and parents had starting the senior year. The parents are very appreciative that the district took notice of this crisis and immediately brought the teachers to tutor students for the Ayers Math and English portion of the test, as Mr. Thompson had mentioned. This is a mandatory class that the student goes to five days a week and gets a grade. Well, the student got back the summer results in September and found out that once again they were shy one point. The student informed the parents in tears, you might as well cancel my graduation party, I will not be graduating. <laughs> That's a story that I'm afraid if we can't get the legislature to bend or yield, it's going to be all too uncommon. And, and again, um, by and large, we're not talking about students who wouldn't have otherwise graduated. We're talking about students who would have graduated. Um, and they're simply getting caught up in what I believe is the politics of what's happening uh, as it relates to public education. So um, hopefully we're, we're, we're going to try to appeal to both Democrats and Republicans um, because we're represented pretty evenly actually by both. Um, and uh, my understanding is there could be some headway. And so we're going to try to do our best um, to represent the school board. I, I believe the community at large uh, by applying as much pressure as we possibly can on our legislature to legislators to rethink this decision and we know they are just going to apply that pressure so at some point or another you may get an e-blast from me asking you to write uh, to your local legislator both on the house and senate side um, to try to help us get a push to let's just if we want to change the game let's change it for the incoming freshmen and we can talk to those parents and those students about that the whole way through versus in the middle mid-stride so, I still have more. I still have more. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were done. I'm sorry. Well, I gave you a break, though. No, thank you. Collect yourself. I, I, you did. Thank you. And additional background on this student is that they are a second-year student in the Allied Health Program. In March, they are supposed to take the state test to be certified to work in the field of health care. In this student's case, if they pass this and the work he's test that was mentioned earlier, 
which guess what? When the per student took it, how many points do you think they were shy of passing it? <laughs> if they pass that plus the state exam, that will override that one point if that is the case. That student, if they pass the state assisted nursing exam, could possibly be taking care of your loved ones while bringing in a paycheck and grade for their last quarter of school. However, the state says if they are missing that one point, they are not ready for college and the real world. The additional questions the parents have for the legislators are, what if the student does not get the extra point needed in the December test? What will, they do, what will that do to their mental well-being? <clears throat> After learning results in February, how do you enjoy your remaining three months of senior year knowing that you're not going to commencement? How do you tell the student to flip the switch and be positive and in the right frame of mind to take the state nursing test? How do you push a student to study hard on an ACT retake their senior year? And how do 13 years of education, including honors and AP classes, being a part of National Juniors and Honor Society, participating in extracurricular events, after school come down to one point? There is a permanent cloud over senior year that no senior should have to feel. This student is my daughter. I had to talk to about her in the third person for two reasons. First, I knew I would get too emotional <laughs> telling her story. I don't feel the legislators at the state level who are making these decisions are living with a child going through what we are going through as a family. The second reason is that every student who is shy one or more points has a story. The story may not be like my daughter's, but they have a story. I could sit here for hours and go on, but I will end with saying my husband and I are truly have 100% confidence in our child that I will be handing her her diploma. It's just that we never thought our senior year we'd be dealing with this. And in addition, I have to thank the teachers who she has had all these years for getting her to this point. Because it's not, I mean, as you heard, state testing has changed over the years. That's not, that's not their fault. We've had wonderful teachers who have gotten her to our senior year. So I want that to be known. And I can also say with confidence, the board, Superintendent Steve Thompson and the administration are here and committed to seeing these students like my daughter graduate. We feel the whole child needs to be looked at in their entirety. That is why we are making sure we're, we are their voice to bring about change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jensky. Okay, how do you like that, Eileen? You get to follow that. Um, <laughs> Um, I, um, Eileen Bowers is our Director of Pupil Services, uh, incredibly difficult job, complex job, maybe one of the most complex in the district, quite frankly, uh, and she's going to give us a riveting update about idea Part B, Special Education Funds. Right. Um, this is in your agenda, I'll just keep this uh, really quick. Uh, we get federal funds from, from the federal government, or various populations of children, one of which is special and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, we, th this money is, comes in grant form, it doesn't have to pay back, it <coughs> combined with state programs to um, help su supplement the expenditures of special education. This year we got $1,775,301.55. <laughs> uh, of that money, it all has to 100% be spent on special so of that money, we put aside 55% of the money for um, outside tuition. We have kids in our district who can't uh, be educated in, in our district. It's just not restrictive enough for them. So that goes towards them. We also um, have gotten our juniors and seniors involved in a special needs vocational program that is outstanding and kids are really doing well in that. We contribute a lot of the funds to that as well. Um, we have about 39, 40% of that, of that grant that goes towards special education salaries. We take five teacher salaries out of there, seven eights, and two of our super special supervisors salaries come out of that. We also have about 2% of that money that goes towards um, special needs devices that the child needs, like an augmentative device, a communication device, um, any kind of OT therapy, sensory needs kinds of things. Um, and then lastly, about 4% of that money goes to um, modified curriculum. We have some kids, we've talked a lot tonight about standards of our special needs kids who can't follow those standards, have what the state calls extended standards. 
that are linked to those, but they're modified, so um, that requires a, a specific curriculum. So we put some of our money towards that as well as PD for our teachers to teach that kind of curriculum. So um, that's about it in a nutshell. Anybody have any questions about it? Thank you, okay, resolutions for the superintendent. Here we go. 5A. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. Item A for your consideration is a 2018-19 classified substitute pay rate increase. It just reflects uh, the pay increase that the uh, rest of the district receipt employees received. Plus, it helps us stay a little bit competitive. Over the superintendent's recommendation, and we're looking for a motion and a second on item 5A, 2018-2019 classified substitutes pay rate increase. Madam President, Mrs. Pritchens, I make the motion to pass 5A, 2018-19 classified substitutes pay rate increase. Thank you, Mrs. Pritchens. Is there a second? Madam yeah. President, Dr. Beal, I'll second that motion. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we approve 5A 2018-19 classified substitutes pay rate increase. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Parkinson, will you call the roll? Mrs. Pritzky? Yes. <coughs> Dr. Beale? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Zern? Yes. Mrs. Warren? Yes. Motion is carried. Mr. Thompson? Thank you, Madam President. Item B for your consideration is the 2018-19 professional development stipends. The critical piece is we're trying to uh, improve instruction, introduce new instructional strategies, testing cycles, et cetera, new software uh, that we um, allow opportunity for professional development of our teachers. So that is what it is for. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. You have heard the superintendent's recommendation. What is the board's pleasure? Madam President. Mrs. Zern. I make the motion to approve item 5B. 2018-2019 professional development stipends. Thank you, Mrs. Zern. Is there a second? Madam President. Mr. Jones. I second that motion. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we approve item 5B, 2018-19 professional development stipends. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Parkinson, will you call the roll? Mrs. Zern. Yes. Mr. Jones. Yes. Mrs. Pachinski. Yes. Dr. Beale. Yes. Mrs. Warren. Yes, motion has carried. Mr. Thompson? Uh, thank you, Madam President. 2018-19, this is item C, adult welding salary schedule. Again, kudos to Laura. You get two tonight. Boy, you are just doing well. Uh, she heads up also our adult education programs. Um, they provide both a great service to our community and um, and generate revenue for the school district to, to significant revenue. So um, she's done a great job in that. And this is the salary schedule for the instructor for the program, who was very difficult to find. But we have found and we are moving. Awesome. Looking for a motion for item 5C, 2018-19 welding, adult welding salary schedule. Madam President. Oh, sorry. Mr. Go. Jones. Go ahead. Uh, Madam President, I motion to approve item 5C, 2018-2019 adult welding salary schedule. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Is there a second? Madam President, I second that motion. Thank you, Dr. Bale. It's been moved and seconded that we approve item 5C, 2018-2019 adult welding salary schedule. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Parkinson, we call the roll. Mr. Jones? Yes. Dr. Beal? Yes. Mrs. Zern? Yes. Mrs. Pachinski? Yes. Mrs. Warner? Yes. Motion is carried. Mr. Thompson? Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, item D for your consideration is a memorandum of agreement. Uh, historically, our union president um, teaches two periods and then is off to do union business the rest of the day. And this is an agreement that reimburses us from, uh, from the union itself uh, for said compensation, offset compensation. You have heard the superintendent's recommendation. What is the board's pleasure? Madam President. Thank you, I'd Mrs. Pruchinski. I'd like to approve item 5D, memorandum of agreement. Thank you, Mrs. Pruchinski. Is there a second? Madam President. Mrs. Zurin. I will second. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded that we approve item 5D, memorandum of agreement. Is there any discussion? 
Hearing none, Mr. Parkinson, will you call the roll? Mrs. Praczynski? Yes. Mrs. Zarin? Yes. Dr. Beal? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Warner? Yes. The motion is carried. Mr. Thompson? Uh, Madam President, item E for your consideration is the school safety training grant. It's in excess of just a little over $44,000, uh, which is outstanding. So we can use that money uh, for the training of personnel and as it relates to safety and security. Item F for your consideration is the Novell recommendation for advanced placement course. Um, this is basically our, did I say Novell? That's a software package that's very old, isn't it? <laughs> Novel, thank you. <laughs> so we're going to go back to an old software program and replace it with a book called The Battle of the Hymn. So um, anyway, it's a, a book for a novel for the advanced placement class uh, that requires Board of Education approval. It's a very good question. Yes, it is. Um, item G for your consideration is the 2018 LPDC handbook. It's been revised. And Mr. Murphy, kudos to which teacher? Mike Bonick. Mike Bonick did a lot of work on this, and so kudos to him. And if you see him around, um, please congratulate him or thank him for his work. Item H for your consideration is a list of the um, bus stops. Um, I just would say that part of what becomes very difficult about bus stops, I believe, were the only district I'm aware of that allows for a parent to have multiple bus stops. Um, in other words, it could be mom's house, dad's house, grandma's house, and babysitter's house. And you can imagine, as all these things change constantly, how difficult it is for the transportation. So um, I would like to see at some point, although I'm not saying, you know, I'd like for us just to take a look at that and recognize that that's a great service we provide, and, but it creates some hiccups sometimes. But keep that in mind as we try to be flexible. Uh, for our community. Item A for your consideration is, uh, is the modification to mediation agreement. Um, Mr. Murphy, do you, ha do you have anything on that that makes sense from your perspective or that you wanted to, to add to that? Um, essentially, it, it's a lot of it's blacked out in your, if you open up your, um, <laughs> your uh, but it has a lot to do with, um, it's, well, it's probably more actually special ed and Eileen than Mr. Murphy. So Mr. Murphy, you can stop your, your heartbeat back <laughs> now. Um, uh, it, as it relates with the Cleveland cl Clinic and some of the things we have to do. So there's so much redaction on your document. I know that it's hard to, to, to read. But if you have any questions about that, um, Eileen can certainly help us address that. Item J is an overnight out of district field trip request. Uh, this one takes us um, through uh, a Thursday and a Friday to DC, and that's North High School. And item K for your consideration is the same, um, and this is Willoughby South, and this is a golf tournament uh, that has them. Uh, as you can see, it's already taken place. So you might ask, why is it on the agenda now after it's already taken place? It is not the fault of the golf coach or the athletic director, but somehow when it was sent to central office, it got sent to the wrong place in central office, and someone saw it and didn't re recognize what it was until we discovered it. So I apologize for the error, but I still think it's important to, it went off without a hitch, but nonetheless, uh, I want to bring it to your attention and seek your approval something that's already happened. I'm not sure how much debate we have over that. Um, item L for your consideration is a, is a list of um, policies. These are adoption of the policies. Um, so this is the final read on those policies. Um, kudos to Mr. Murphy as I give it to him all the frequently as it relates to policies. And I walk by the office and I see him in there with the person and I just think, thank goodness that is not me and they're going through policies and they're thick and they're long and they're and they're repetitive, repetitive and mundane mm -hmm. so but Chuck's the perfect person for it yeah no Chuck's a lot of fun 
And item M for your consideration is the personnel agenda. Again, all the folks that appear within your attachments um, are pending satisfactory uh, receipt of records from the Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation, Ohio Department of Education, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, prior to their full employment within the school district. Item A was, um, wow. Yeah. Wow, that's when I saw you mind-numbingly staring, isn't it? And for those of you that can't see that, if you can't follow along, it is a long list of policies. Um, 37. Uh, 37 of them. Yeah, so have fun reading those, and, and uh, that'll take several nights. Um, but know that it's really important. It's actually very critical when you least expect it. When there's a problem and your policies aren't updated or aren't, uh, aren't in alignment with um, Ohio Revised Code, creates uh, a lot of exposure for the school district. So Mr. Murphy does a great job of keeping up on all of those. That is a first reading. So if you have any of those questions about any of those policies, if you could please let us know. Uh, we'll do our best to get those modifications made based on your feedback prior to next month when we'll ask for final approval of those, um, of those uh, policies. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. The next meeting of this Board of Education will be Monday, November 19th. Notice the change there. It will be here at the Northern Career Institute, East Lake Campus, and it says here it will be at 6 p.m., but that's... Yeah, he's it, it's, it will probably be at 7 p.m. We'll just have one of you two here at 6 p.m. That is correct. I think it's... Yeah. I so think it's I you don't have to come until 7, is yeah. what I'm telling the audience. We'll make that correction. That um, The next meeting is the 19th of November, not the usual time frame, mainly because of the Capitol Conference. And um, a lot of the people sitting here will be going to that. So I'm looking for a motion to adopt the consent calendar. Madam President. Dr. Beal. I move that we accept the uh, uh, consent calendar. Thank you. Is there a second? Madam yeah. President. Mrs. Zern? I will second, please. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the consent calendar for this meeting. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Parkinson, will you call the roll? Dr. Beal? Yes. Mrs. Zern? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mrs. Pruszynski? Yes. Mrs. Warren? <coughs> Yes, the consent calendar has been approved. Um, before we go to our little board discussion, I wonder if there's any press here. I didn't think there was, but I just want to make sure. Okay, we're going to um, go somewhere warmer, wherever that may be, and have a finishing discussion on our um, evaluation process scores, and um, then we will adjourn. You're welcome to sit around, promise at the table. Could I throw, put in, uh, just mention something that... Um, we, oh, yes, we're going to do yeah, that. Yeah, that something, and we're, we're going to try to make sure that we round back to questions that are brought before the board. Uh, forgive me for not being smooth at this at this point, but we had a question brought to us about uh, the ninth graders and at Soy and whether or not there'll be a high school. Uh, we have a parent meeting that's coming up with the seventh and eighth graders. It is the intent and the direction and strategic plan of the district to have a high school, um, but of course it's predicated on whether there are students there or not. Um, but I anticipate that we will have a high school unless there's something happening I'm unaware of. Uh, so that was a question that was brought before us. Um, and then um, also a request was made to put the board, put these meetings online because we had done it for a number of years and then we stopped doing it. Mr. McKinney, how many hits did we get over the last two years on those board agendas? Yeah. <laughs> so we are going to put them up. They're back up there. Um, we'll monitor the hits. If we hit double digits, we'll throw a party. Um, but They're all invited because they're actually they, here. <laughs> but they are there. Um, that was a request, and it, was, it seems to be a reasonable request. Um, so they are they are there. So we'll try to come back and answer these questions as they come into the board as well. Sorry for not putting that in the proper okay. order.
going to try to do that at every meeting near the end. If there's questions, there weren't any today, but if there are questions, um, we will try to do that. Um, I believe all of us try our best to answer questions when we get them in, in the on the phone or email, but um, this way it assures that everybody in public knows that we answered the questions as well. So we're going to go to the warmer room, and um, you're welcome to go home or stay and uh, we will be out of here relatively quickly. Thanks for coming.